The title of this conference, All Things Digital, made me think about the concept of digital information because we live in a universe that can embody digital information, but we've gone through different epics in our ability to do that. The, uh, I wrote about six epics in my book, The Singularity is Near, and the first epic is that we had, we uh, live in a universe that can embody digital information in chemical structures, in atomic and molecular uh, relationships, particularly the carbon atom, since it can create uh, interactions in four different directions, it's very good at embodying information. And each of these stages then evolved into the next stage. So over about a billion years here on Earth, we evolved DNA, which is a very special molecule that can then record digital information in a linear sequence of, uh, of amino acids and embody information uh, in those protein structures. And then we had an evolutionary process of the organisms that DNA gave rise to and ultimately evolved brains, which could in fact record digital information inside their brains. And it's actually digital controlled analog information. And it's interesting to compare brains to our computers. Uh, our brains send messages through chemical signals that travel a few hundred feet per second. That's a million times slower than electronics today. Uh, the interneuronal connections can compute 200 calculations per second. That's a million times slower than computers. But they're organized in three dimensions. They're massively parallel. We have 100 trillion connections. But at any rate, epic three was information, digital information in brains. And then a species evolved that had an opposable appendage, a thumb. And it might look like a chimpanzee's thumb is similar, but actually it's a bad design. If you watch a chimp, they're very clumsy holding a stick. They don't have a power grip. They don't have fine motor coordination. Really, Homo sapiens were unique in our ability to take our what-if experiments and actually change the world. And then we brought in the fourth epic, which was technology, and that's been its own evolutionary process. And that has also accelerated, and that emerged smoothly from the biological evolution that gave rise to our species. And then we'd store digital information in our technology. And with the advent of, our, of computers, we do that quite literally. And now we're in the fifth epic where we're reverse engineering biology, actually understanding how it works, applying those lessons to our technology, and then using our technology to augment, ultimately to replace biology. Because as, in, as interesting as biology is, as intricate and clever as biology is, we find that through nanotechnology, we can actually engineer things that are thousands and sometimes millions of times more powerful. And I want to come back to that, that idea. And then epic six is when we saturate the matter and energy here on Earth to support computation and we need to move out to the rest of the universe and whether or not we can transcend the speed of light will become actually an important issue in the 22nd century. But uh, I don't want to dwell on that issue. But getting back to cell phones, uh, this is a very good example of the kind of acceleration that Ian was talking about. It took us 10 years to put out the first billion cell phones, three years to put out the second. We put out the third billion cell phones in the last one year. We'll put out three billion more in the next two years. And as, we've, and as they've become less and less expensive, they've also become more and more powerful. If you remember 15 years ago, someone took out a mobile phone in a movie. That was a producer's signal that this person was a member of the power elite because only somebody very wealthy could afford a mobile phone. They were called satellite phones. And they didn't work very well, and they, uh, they weighed as much as a brick. And today, they're really invading the rest of the world. Even Africa is ubiquitous with cell phones. And I've developed a codification of the acceleration and exponential growth that Ian alluded to. I realized about 30 years ago that the key to being successful as an inventor was to actually tie my technologies to be appropriate for the particular moment. And most technologies fail, most inventors fail, not because they can't get their gadgets to work, but because the timing is wrong. Not all the enabling factors are in place when they need to be. And realizing that, I started gathering data. Being an engineer, I collected data. I've got now a group of 10 people that gather data in many different fields, including biology, which is becoming an information technology. And we build mathematical models of how technology evolves. 
And while on the one hand specific projects, and Ian mentioned quite a few projects, some of them succeed, some of them fail, and that's very hard to predict. But the overall impact of information technology, the price performance, the bandwidth, the amount of data being moved around, follow exquisitely predictable uh, pr uh, trajectories. If you were to ask me what will the cost of a MIPS of computing be in 2010, or the cost of sequencing DNA in 2012, or the spatial resolution of brain scanning in 2014, I can give you a figure and it's likely to be correct. And I've been doing this actually for 30 years. My book, The Age of Intelligent Machines, which I wrote 20 years ago, published at MIT, had hundreds of predictions about the 1990s and early 2000 years, which have tracked very accurately. I saw the ARPANET doubling every year, but it was not a significant phenomenon in the 1980s. There was a few thousand scientists. Went from 10,000 nodes to 20,000 in one year, and then to 40,000. But doubling every year is multiplying by 1,000 in a decade. So I saw that the, by the mid-1990s, this would be 20 million going to 40 million, 80 million, 160 million. It would be a World Wide Web connecting millions, ultimately hundreds of millions of people. That seemed ridiculous in the 1980s when you had this very expensive, very inefficient, slow network connecting a few thousand scientists. But it was clear that the exponential growth would continue. And in fact, that happened right on schedule. I saw the chess supercomputers doubling in power of year. That added 40 points to the chess score because the chess score is a logarithmic scale. That put the crossover where a computer would pass the world chess champion in 1998. That seemed ridiculous in 1983 when an average chess player could beat the best chess machines. 1993, Kasparov was asked about this prediction, and he said, that's absurd. I've played the best chess machines in the world, and they're pathetic. And that was reasonable in 1993, but they saw it past him in 97. And this technology is very democratizing, in my view. I wrote in, in that first book in the 1980s that the Soviet Union was doomed from the emerging decentralized electronic communication. This clandestine network of email over teletype machines and early fax machines. And that is, in fact, what did in the coup against Gorbachev in 1991. So I apply these models, which are remarkably predictable. And I'll show you a few dozen examples. We have hundreds of these in, in our lab now. Uh, but I use, I use them primarily to tie my own technology projects. So in 2002, I had a conversation with the head of the National Federation of the Blind who said, Ray, you've been talking about blind people being able to take a device out of their pocket and capture all the print in the world as they go through the day uh, for many years. Now, when do you think this will be feasible? And I said, according to our models of digital camera technology and cell phones and pocket computers, we'll have the requisite hardware in six years, 2008, first quarter to be exact. And he said, OK, when will the software, how long will it take to do the software? And I said, well, we'll have to do more than just compress opti optical character recognition and text-to-speech synthesis into a pocket computer. We'll have to have a new layer of software. As, as, so as a blind person holds the device, we can correct for three different degrees of freedom of tilt and rotation, uneven illumination, curved images, shadows, uh, other vagaries of real-world images uh, with the device being held by a blind person. Uh, he said, well, how long will that take? I said, six years. So he said, let's get started.